Hello and welcome to Own Your Truth, where we're talking real advice for regular people. I am Laura T. Thank you for listening. Tonight we're talking about the mindset of money, and so much of it is your mindset. As a coach around this time of year, I tend to hear two things. Either, number one, after doing my taxes, I realize I didn't actually make very much money, or number two, I'm finally making good money and I can't believe I have to pay so much in taxes. Well, think about it. Have you ever said you wanted something and then actually complained about the consequences of the result? Well, if you're like the rest of us, the answer is probably yes. What you may not realize is that your language around money and taxes is actually creating resistance to the exact thing you say you want, which is more money. So we're gonna talk about that in more detail a little bit later in the show. But before I dive into the topic of money, I need to address the taboo associated with money talk. You often hear, uh, never talk about money, religion, or politics, as if it's this like golden rule. Well, although this is well-intended advice, the reality is the lack of conversation about money, in this case, is part of the reason why many of us are illiterate on all three topics. Unless you're having conversations about money, religion, or even politics, you have no way of learning what you don't know. And the truth is, most of what you know about these topics were passed down from generation to generation, from your grandparents to your parents, and there might be some slight shifts, but mostly they stay the same and they were probably never questioned. So if you were born into a financially literate family, well, lucky you, but if you're like most of us, you were born into a family doing the best you can with what you have, And as a result, you likely took on your family's belief, both those that are liberating as well as those that are limiting around money. So for instance, I'll use a lot of personal examples tonight as we talk about money. I grew up in a family business and there were a lot of really liberating, encouraging beliefs like you can do anything if you work hard and it's better to take a risk and fail than to never take a risk at all. Those are all great. Along with those beliefs, there were also limiting beliefs like nothing comes for free, money doesn't grow on trees, and to pay for the things you want, business has to come first. And so growing up, I never questioned these. And even though we talked about business and money, we didn't address these limiting beliefs because, uh, to be honest, no one realized they were limiting. But Let's take a minute right now, listen to the difference when I change a few words from the previous statements. So instead of nothing comes for free, what if you believed lots comes for free, a lot comes for free, when you start to look for free stuff? And instead of money doesn't grow on trees, how about money has the ability to grow anywhere you plant ideas? And then finally, instead of a statement like, in order to pay for the things you want, business has to come first, a small shift could be, you can afford what you want and have the life experience you dream about when you get resourceful. You see, these two millimeter shifts in thinking can have a huge impact on your approach to money, and it has an impact on the message you pass down and pass on to the people around you. And don't forget, we influence people with our language, with our beliefs, whether it's kids or colleagues or um, even just unsuspecting people uh, in our environment. People are listening to beliefs. And when you're talking about a subject so hardly talked about like money, they're paying attention. So tonight we're going to talk a lot about the mindset of money, but this isn't that wishful thinking type stuff. We're going to get practical on what you can do to realistically evaluate where you are financially, look for ways to get resourceful about increasing your mindset on money, and then we're going to talk about what it takes to live in abundance regardless of your financial situation. So let's get started. So Let's talk a little bit about how the brain works. 
Now, listen, I am not a neuroscientist um, or anywhere near it, but in all of the research I've done in helping people make meaningful progress, I have learned a thing or two about the brain. Anyone who listens to the show regularly, or if you happen to spend time with me, you have already heard pieces of what I'm about to share, if you haven't heard all of it, because it is something that I say often. But regardless of how many times you hear it, or even how many times I hear myself say it, it's worth repeating because it's powerful information. So there are a couple of cool things about the brain works that impact how you look at money, and you probably don't even realize it. First, in the simplest terms, your brain has two jobs. What it does is it answers your questions and proves you're right. So whenever you ask a question or make a statement silently to yourself or out loud to someone else, your brain searches its database of already consumed information for the answer, which is why it's so important to ask yourself smart questions and to care about what you say internally and externally because your brain is always listening. Let me give you an example of using money as the topic. So most people unconsciously ask themselves questions like, why can't I get out of debt? Or they make statements like, I can't afford that. Keeping in mind this idea that your brain has two jobs to answer your questions and prove you're right, your brain says, oh, I'll tell you why you can't get out of debt. Uh, because you don't have a good enough job, or maybe you're buried, buried in college loans, or you got knocked down during the stock market or housing bubbles. There's lots of reasons why. And with that question, you stay exactly where you are, stuck in debt. When you make statements like, I can't afford that, your brain, once again, searches for proof and provides all of the reasons you can't afford it. Sadly, these often show up as comparisons to other people. You know, I have a crappy job, or I'm not rich like Joe and Joanne Money Pants. Obviously, I made up those names. I don't have a college degree, so I'll never make enough to afford what I want. You know where I'm going. The cycle is endless. Your brain will come up with reasons and proof that you're right. So, let's make a shift. Listen to the difference a two millimeter shift in these messages can make. So instead of why can't I get out of debt, what changes when you ask yourself, what does it take to have what I want? And you could use, you know, to have a zero balance on my credit cards or what does it take to have $5,000 in savings? Whatever it is that you want to have. Asking the question that gets you toward what you want instead of asking about where you are. Another example, what does it take to afford that? Your brain will look for the answer and will come up with solutions. The big key here is don't get wedded to only one solution. The idea is to allow your brain to come up with many options because it's what it does naturally and you may even surprise yourself with ideas. The other benefit to coming up with multiple options is that not everything is going to work and so you want to have alternatives for your, for your brain and for your, your body to consider when one thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean you have to give up on the goal, it simply means you have to shift what you're doing. You see, there's another nifty part of the brain most people don't talk about called the reticular activating system. It's a super cool network of nerve pathways in the brain that basically mediates consciousness. Well, let's make it a little bit more simple. What it really does is it acts as a filter for the information your brain receives. We get so much information each day. Without this filter, our brains would go on overload. So the challenge is most people don't consciously use the filter for what they want. Instead, they unconsciously focus on where they are. Let me give you an example here. When you send your brain a message that focuses on debt, then quite frankly, that's all you see. I was working with a client running his own business and uh, he was constantly talking about not having money and being in debt and his business got not going well. Well, it was interesting because after a few months of working together and hearing the amount of success he was having, the language didn't fit what was what was going on. So um, we started to look at his finances. 
when he ran his numbers, he realized he actually made really good money in his business and he was bringing home more income than he'd ever thought. But what he didn't realize was that he wasn't seeing the success because he was focused on the debt he'd accumulated during a bad economy. And so he didn't separate the two so that he could see the reality of the abundance that he was living in. Instead, he focused on the debt that he had accumulated. It was really important for him to change his filter so that he no longer connected his ability to pay off debt with the success he was having in his business. Once I brought this to his attention, he realized that this mindset had actually held him back for years. All right, so this kind of gives you a sense of the mindset and your brain and how it impacts the way you think about money. So if you are a regular Own Your Truth with Laura T listener, you'll see that tonight's show is a little bit different in that I'm going to be asking you more questions than I will be providing you information. The idea is to get you to think differently, and the best way to do that is to get your mind exploring possibility. And so we're going to start by looking at what changes when you think about money as energy. So stay with me because I'm not talking about field of dream stuff like think about money and it will come. Although that mindset will help. That's not where I'm going right now. The truth is, since 1971, U.S. currency has been a fiat standard meaning it's not backed by any physical asset like gold or silver. So if we acknowledge money as plain paper with ink on it, backed by nothing but our willingness to accept it as currency, what changes if we look at money as energy? And we think consciously every time we buy or sell something as this exchange of energy. How does the way you view your job change? When you think about the conscientious exchange of energy, what happens when you remove this idea of working for money and think about the value of your energy? How does this idea of energy change the meaning you give someone's offer to buy you something, whether it be something as simple as like a cup of coffee or something bigger like a meal? Or maybe even when someone offers to lend or even better, give you money, right? For some people, it's easy to accept those gifts. For other people, it's not. But when you think about someone generously giving you their energy, does that help you make a shift? Because it's important to keep in mind, when we don't accept the gift of someone else's energy, we're literally stopping the flow of it which is why so many people in business um, have you know starts and stops or they have big highs and big lows because they haven't created, created the momentum of giving and receiving energy because they're still working hard for money, right? They're still dependent on the ebbs and flows of finances. When you look at energy, it's something that you can have control over. It's something that you have an impact on in terms of what you give, and you have an impact in how you receive it. So what happens when you think more deeply about where you spend your money? And in this case, we're talking energy, right? So for example, is buying junk at Walmart how you want to share your precious energy? Is having more stuff in your house how you want to store your gift of energy? Does looking at money as energy have you think differently about giving your money away to someone or something like a charitable organization, right? This idea of freely giving, not waiting until you believe you can afford it, but just knowing that this flow of energy creates momentum. Thinking about money as energy can also help you get really resourceful, right? I mean, I just sat for a minute and thought about all the ways to increase personal energy. Well, the first thing I go for is a a drink, a cup of coffee, right? Or there's exercise. You could listen to music. You could spend time with energetic people. You could go outdoors. You could walk. You could meditate. I mean, the list of creating energy feels really infinite, 
And yet, when most people think about ways of making money, they get stuck on increasing wealth through their job. And so starting to think about this idea of money as energy and using this energy to get really resourceful about ways to increase your financial wealth, it's absolutely awesome once you start to use it. And so we're going to talk about the language of money a little bit later. But before we do that, you have to know where you are. So let's jump into the mindset of money. Because most people aren't talking about money, it's like you're not spending time evaluating or looking at your current mindset around money, right? I mean, if you're like most of us, you're kind of just responding to the money that comes in and then the bills that you have to pay and the money that goes out. Well, it's important to know where you are so that you can monitor and measure progress to where you wanna go. And in order to get to where you want to go, you have to define it. So remember I mentioned a lot of today's show is gonna be around asking you questions. I'm gonna give you a series of 10 questions for you to really think about where you are and where you wanna be with your money. Okay. The caveat before we dive into these questions is do not judge yourself while you're answering these. Really look honestly at how you evaluate your current financial thinking. It's not until you own your truth about where you are that you can be realistic about how to get to where you want to be. All right, so let's start off with question number one. What beliefs do you have about money? And with this question, you want to name them all. Remember to name both the liberating beliefs as well as the limiting beliefs. You know, I gave a couple of examples of both at the beginning of the show. So question number one, what beliefs do you have about money? Number two, how could you shift your limiting beliefs from statements that don't serve you to believable statements that help you move forward? And the key here is to focus on believable. You know, I am um, a strong proponent of affirmations, and yet you can't state an affirmation that you don't believe. So, you know, if you want to be rich and you are, you know, thousands of dollars in debt, it's too big of a jump to go mentally. And so you want to be realistic about where you want to be and look at ways to move forward. Again, starting from where you are. So question number two, how could you shift your limiting beliefs from statements that don't serve you to believable statements that help you move forward? Question number three, how would you describe your current financial situation? Again, it's really important to be honest with yourself about where you are. You're not gonna stay in this question. It's going to help us make progress to questions going forward, but you want to know where you are now. And then how would you, so question number three, how would you describe your current financial situation? Question number four, how would you describe your ideal financial situation? And again, keeping in mind that that notion of ideal is ideal based on where you are now. You want to stack your successes to get to the highest level. And if dreaming about an ideal where, you know, you're driving a Maserati and living in a multi-million dollar home is really far from your, you know, um, old VW and, you know, your $150,000 house, get Get to the next step where you are is perfect for right now and you can make progress. Just make sure that you're making um, statements that are believable in terms of where you can be. So number four, how would you describe your ideal financial situation? Number five, on a scale of one to ten and one being totally unsatisfied, ten being totally satisfied, how would you rate your satisfaction with your current financial situation? So I'll repeat that on a scale of one to 10, one being totally unsatisfied and 10 being totally satisfied. How would you rate your satisfaction with your current financial situation? Question number five leads us to question number six, and this is the real important one. Again, we use a scale for us to be able to monitor and measure progress. If 
in question number five, so now we're on question number six, if in question number five you were less than a 10, what would it take to increase your financial satisfaction one or two levels closer to your ideal financial situation? So notice, I didn't say what would it take to go from where you are right now to a 10, right? Because again, as I've mentioned, for some people, that's too big a jump. Remember, you're looking for believable, attainable progress. And so you want to look at if you rated yourself a four in terms of satisfaction, what would it take to get to a level five or six? And maybe even take that a step further to define what does a level five or six look for you in terms of financial satisfaction? So again, question number six, if you are less than a 10 on your scale of financial satisfaction, what would it take to increase your financial satisfaction one or two levels closer to your ideal financial situation? Okay, on to question number seven. What do you believe it will take to reach your ideal situation? So sometimes people think about their ideal, again, as sort of that stretch. It's kind of like a joke. I want to be, um, you know, driving that expensive car and flying around in a helicopter. And listen, I, I take it from me. It is possible. It just may not be a mindset possibility for you to make big jumps. And so um, you want to make sure that this does not become um, something that's so far out of reach that you can't get there. And you also want to make sure that the the answer isn't something that's more like a, a to-do list. Like, um, oh, um, what would it take? It would take me getting a raise. That isn't something you necessarily always have control over. So you want to make sure that what your answer to this question is a direct focus on an end result, right? So some examples could be having a zero balance on a credit card bill, or for some people it's having, you know, 50,000 or more in savings, right? So making sure that whatever you decide is something that's believable to you. All right, so a repeat of question number seven. What do you believe it will take to reach your ideal situation? Question number eight. What prevents you from making progress on your current financial situation? You know, on this one, you want to make sure you're writing down all of the things you can think of because you want to address what's standing in your way so that you can start to chip away at those limiting beliefs. For some people, they're really strong, inherent beliefs. For other people, they're little things that once they see them on paper, they're like, oh, wait, that's not so hard. I can do that. You want to make them manageable. So question number eight. What prevents you from making progress on your current financial situation? Question number nine. Specifically, what is one thing you can do today, today is the key, to start to overcome what prevents you from making progress? You know, it's putting that line in the sand and deciding today I'm committed to doing something and then continuing that commitment over time because it really is that stacking of successes, it really is that compounding effect of thinking about money in a positive way, even saving money. Um, those things add up and you don't want to wait. Start with something small that you can accomplish today and you can see success to build on going forward. So question number nine, specifically, what is one thing you could do today to start to overcome what prevents you from making progress? And then question number 10, where do you want to be financially at the end of the month? You know, you want to break it down your mindset about money into manageable chunks. I've kind of mentioned this throughout the 10 questions. For most people, that starts with 30 days. You want to be, you know, it's interesting to me, a lot of people will go really bold in their annual goals and then work backward. And the sad part is for most people, that doesn't work. And so I suggest... Don't overestimate what you can do in a year and then get frustrated when you don't reach your goal each month. Instead, build on success. Come up with a 30-day success point that gets you a little bit out of your comfort zone but feels reachable so that you can build on it. And then you can extend your goals quarterly, biannually, and then get to sort of those bigger overall annual goals. 
So repeat of question number 10, where do you want to be financially at the end of the month? You know, although while answering these questions, you're exploring the truth of where you are financially, you can see that the goal is to help you focus on where you want to be. Because remember, we're going to go back to, you know, the beginning of the show when I talked about your brain having two jobs to answer your questions and prove you right. Stay focused on the questions that get you looking forward and toward the future and get you excited about the idea of energy and a new mindset around money. Because from those things come living in abundance, which is really based on the language you have around money. And so that's going to be our final topic tonight. And when we think about, you know, language, what does that have to do with money? Well, I reference a study by Dr. Masuro Omoto, a Japanese researcher, who claimed the human conscious has an effect on molecular structure of water. You know, he ran a series of tests to see the effect of speaking words on frozen water. And he later in his life did experiments with rice. The, the results were absolutely fascinating. Words like thank you, love, and peace created beautiful frozen water crystals, while the opposite happened with words like you make me sick, I will kill you. They actually created dark, unstructured frozen masses. So when you see the physical signs of the impact of words on water, and then you keep in mind that 60% of your body is made of water and approximately 73% of your brain is water. The impact of your words extends far beyond whatever is said in the moment. It's so important to remember this. We tend to be generic with our words and really harsh with our self-talk, especially when it comes to finances. And so... I use an example, like, have you ever heard um, someone say, or have you even said yourself, oh, I can't afford it? And in your heart, you knew it was more of an excuse because instead of owning your truth that it's not the way you choose to spend your money or it's not something you want to spend your money now, just that generic, like, oh, I can't afford it, it's just easier. Well, in most instances, that difference between a matter of priority versus a matter of affordability is really important. And remember, the challenge is we don't consider the long-term consequence of our language. And yet, that language, I can't afford it, repeated over and over, penetrates your subconscious mind and literally becomes a belief that ultimately creates your reality. And so what do you want your financial reality to be? We talked a little bit about this a while ago, you know, when we were answering those 10 questions. Being honest with where you are and focusing on your future can help you get where you want. It just takes being really conscious about what you say. It takes being resourceful and getting what you want. And then let's bring this full circle. You know, remember at the start of the show, I mentioned the reticular, reticulator, the reticular activating system, right? That little filter. Once you focus your language on what you want, your brain will naturally find a way to filter and get you to it. So focus on abundance, focus on what it takes, write out a list of different ways for you to get there and say it out loud. You will see once you view Dr. Emoto's studies, like the power of language and knowing how much of our mind and body is made up of water, being conscious about our language and money will have a huge impact. So try these on and let me know how you do. Okay. So we're almost at my favorite part of the show, and that's answering your questions. But before we get there, let's take a break to hear this week's Own Your Truth Musical Artist of the Week. You know, tonight I'm honored to feature King Willow, who is originally from Wilton, Connecticut. This is a sister pop project of Juliana and Amanda Silguro. Juliana has been a songwriter since, oh my gosh, before she could talk. And Amanda has been harmonizing and honing her vocal craft basically since birth. And so these two East Coast natives migrated to San Francisco to cut their teeth in the Bay Area singer-songwriter scene. 
during their time there, they've been collaborating with locals and bandmates and their sound has really become this like indie rock influence. So King Willow brings a quality of vulnerability and earnestness to upbeat indie pop. Originally released on Valentine's Day 2019, I'm really excited to share with you King Willow's most recent track, Blue Valentine. Take a listen. listening to Own Your Truth with Laura T. And that was King Willow. Wow, they sound fantastic. Let's get on to Own Your Truth's question and answers. As you know, this is my favorite part of the hour. Tonight, we're answering questions from the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page exclusively. So know that if you didn't get your question in in time for this week's show, I will do my best to answer them personally one-on-one after Uh, the show. So have no fear. Your questions will get answered. Let's dive into what we have. First, the question comes from Carrie from Wilton. I'm a single mom working really hard, but I feel like I can never get ahead. How do I stay positive while my bank account is negative? Carrie, this is a a common feeling for a lot of people. And so, you know, one of the things to consider is going through the 10 questions that I talked about during the show and looking at defining where you are now and where you want to go. You know, in your question, you use language like, I feel like I can never get ahead. One of the first places to start is to define 
What does getting ahead look like for you? And then make it really small and achievable. What does getting ahead look like for you this month, right? Remember, you want to build successes, especially in areas where you feel like you haven't been successful. And so if finances has been something that's been a challenge, you want to make sure that you're building momentum and successes you can see regularly. That may mean making a commitment to save $10 a paycheck, right? It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you put that money, you invest it, you put it even in a bank account, which has very low returns right now, but that compounding effect can have you feel really good when after 10 months, you're looking at $100 and you begin to see that success, right? So start off with defining, first of all, what does getting ahead look like? And then what small steps can you take each week so that you can start to see the positive, even when you feel like the bank account is negative. Carrie, I hope that helps. And I also hope that you'll let me know how it goes. Keep me posted on your success and what steps you decide to take. The next question comes from Mary out of Trumbull. She says, my husband has this crazy strict budget I agreed to follow, but I'm miserable. How can we save money and not live like we're poor? Wow, really great question. And, you know, um, first, you, so much of the show is talking about the mindset around money. Know that whenever you associate budget with misery, it will be exactly that, right? You've already created the filter that this idea of living on a budget is miserable for you. And so that's all you're seeing. So I'm going to recommend your first step, Mary, is to redefine what this budget could be for you. It's also important that you and your husband are looking at um, what's important about a budget. And so, listen, we all know that budgets theoretically are important, but really getting to you as a couple, what's important about a budget? Um, I did work with a really lovely couple who were in a very similar situation. He had really bold um, savings goals and retirement goals. And as a result, he put the family on a really strict budget. And so as part of that process, I suggested that the wife look at the budget and she was comfortable with it, but like you, it made her a little bit miserable. Then explore with your husband, okay, we've looked at cutting, you know, what we spend. What about the, looking the other way? What does it take to make more money? How can we get resourceful in finding ways to bring in more income to our household? So that you're looking at both options and then you don't feel stuck in, in one way, which is cutting the budget. You get to explore ways to possibly make more money, to um, possibly get creative in building a business or working together. There's lots of different things you can think about. And so having that conversation where you're creatively thinking about what you want and how to get there in addition to making sure that you're conscious about how you're spending your money. And remember, we looked at money as energy and looking at this idea of not being miserable with how you're saving your energy, right? Maybe that two millimeter shift will be enough for you to redefine what a budget means for you. And then also, as I mentioned, looking at ways to get creative with your husband and looking at the other opportunities. Well, what can you do to bring in more income? So Mary from Trumbull, I hope that gives you a place to start from and um, let me know how the conversation goes with your husband. Next question is from Tom out of Monroe. After paying off college loans, my mortgage and credit card debt, there's nothing left at the end of the month. Realistically, I won't be able to start saving until I'm into retirement and then it's too late. What advice do you have? Uh, Tom, again, this is a common feeling from a lot of people. And, you know, 
as I've mentioned in my answers to the other questions and as I mentioned during the show, it's so important to start somewhere, right? Like when people think about saving money, they think they have to put away big sums of money. And that's not the case. Start with what you can afford. Maybe that's, you know, $50 a month. Maybe that's $10 a week. Looking at starting so that you can see it building, you can stack that success and know that you can be resourceful in getting what you want. Look at defining, you know, what you need for retirement and then what are some creative ways to help you get there? You know, coming up with um, a, a real result statement that focuses on where you want to be and then this resource list of all of the different ways that you can achieve it. You know, the challenge is when we think about money, it kind of weighs on us. And again, we're told not to talk about it. And yet when we flip over to energy, that's something we can start to get excited about. You know, how can you begin to accumulate more energy? How can you begin to save more energy? Where do you want? to save your energy. Um, maybe these shifts in mind mindset will help you move away from focus on the college loans and the mortgage, which again, most of us face, and looking more toward what you want instead of where you are. Okay, Tim from Shelton. I own a seasonal business, so my income is basically at the whim of the season. How can I focus on mindset when I don't feel like I have any control over my income? Well, Tim, right there in that statement, I don't have any control over my income is clearly what has you at the whim of the season. And so it really is looking at um, where do you want to be in your business? If living by a seasonal business isn't something that works for you, what do you need to feel like you have a successful business that you can depend on financially? I mean, the key is, especially when you're running your own business, is that you're not stuck. You are not defined by anything. You get to reevaluate where you are, where your business is coming from, and even how long your season is, right? That doesn't mean, for instance, if you, know, you live in the Northeast and your season is dependent on snow, that you can make it snow. However, you can look at, all right, if my season is dependent on snow, what are some other things I can do if and when there isn't a lot of snow, right? And so that you're getting really resourceful and creative about what you can do when things don't match the ideal environment for your business to make a lot of money. So really important that you're looking at what you can do and that you're making this shift from I am not at the whim of the season. I am a resourceful human being able to create a meaningful business that can survive during any season, right? I mean, how powerful is that statement? And so come up with a statement that feels really true for you, that gives you the power back to reevaluate your business and create something that's a little bit more consistent for you. I hope that helps, Tim. Um, so the final question tonight comes from um, Sally out of Stratford. I'm a stay-at-home mom looking to make money, but the only opportunities out there seem to revolve around multi-level marketing or telesales, and I don't want to do that. What do you recommend for someone like me? Well, Sally, um, first of all, it's important to know that many people have a successful uh, businesses out of their homes. And yes, some of them are really successful doing multi-level marketing and telesales. And yet, you know, it really... Um, it, it depends on what you want to do. I think it's so important that regardless of whether you're working out of your home or whether you're going to a traditional job, that you're considering how the, the things that you enjoy, right? You're considering, remember we talked about 
energy and what's the value of your energy and looking at um, creating a business that really enhances your energy, that gets you excited. You know, working a business from home can be challenging because you have to wear many hats. And so you want to be do, doing something that you love uh, to make it through the tasks and the challenges when things are slow or even when things are really busy, right? So Start by looking at what do you want to do, and then what are some ways that you can make money doing that? Um, I know the answer is broad, and yet the question is a little bit broad. Really start to focus on uh, making a list of all of your interests, and then on that list, have it separated into columns. You know, what are some ways that you can make money following that interest? And then in the third column, what are some steps you could take today to explore if that's a possibility for you. Again, the gift of working from home is that you can do anything. It's narrowing it down and deciding what is it that you want to do. I hope that helps you out, Sally. And I am so grateful for us spending time together tonight. I hope tonight's um, program on the mindset of money has given you a different perspective on your own finances. You know, living a life of abundance starts with what you believe. I would love to hear your thoughts on today's show. Please visit the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page and tell me what you think. This is Laura T. on Own Your Truth with Laura T. I'll hear you then.